DMEC is most difficult in eyes with shallow and collapsed anterior chambers. And in this video, we're going to show you how you can perform this operation in such eyes. You know, people think that DMEC is most challenging in eyes with really deep anterior chambers, eyes that are post vitrectomy, for example. But in fact, those are the easy type of eyes to deal with because when you have a deep chamber, there's at least room to manipulate and unfold the graft. Whereas in contrast, if you have an eye with a really shallow anterior chamber and everything is compressed and mashed up against each other, then there's no room to do any of your unfolding maneuvers. The graft is just smeared in between the back of the cornea and the front of the iris. These are actually the most challenging eyes to deal with. And I want to show you a case that we dealt with with an, an, in one of our patients in our office-based surgery center just last week. So here's the patient. They're under topical anesthesia that is being supplemented with one cc here of subtenons Expirel, which is being delivered by our PA, Emma Scott. Emma Scott is a PA that we hired and she works with us and she is helping me with this operation by delivering the subconjunctival injection of this anesthetic. I like to use one cc because it provides adequate anesthesia and akinesia without also increasing the posterior pressure. Now here is what the eye looks like as we start the case. And you may appreciate a few little features here which look interesting. So first, you'll notice that there's a bleb up at 12 o'clock. So this is an eye that's previously had a trab. This eye has also had at least one, if not multiple, retinal detachments. The cornea is extremely hazy. It's fibrotic. There is bleeding from the inferior angle when we start the operation for reasons that are unclear. And you may notice that the chamber here, perhaps it seems a little bit shallow. Now, it's tough to tell from this sort of top-down on FOSS view. Let me show you what this chamber actually looks like. This is an OCT we obtained that morning of this patient. Here it is. So I'm going to show it to you. This is what it looks like, this OCT, okay? So let me... Uh, describe it to you and we'll cycle through the images ourselves. okay? So you'll notice the cornea is peculiarly thick and you'll notice this white line going across the back of the cornea. What is that? And as we scrub through, you'll notice that white line is actually the iris. So there is no anterior chamber in this case. The cornea and the iris are fused together across the entire expanse of the back of the cornea, save the pupillary aperture. So there is no anterior chamber to start this case. So that is the situation in which we find ourselves here. So how do we start the operation? Well, the idea is I want to make a paracentesis with a 15 degree blade angled up just to try to wiggle in a space in the periphery where there may be some room to maneuver. So I'm making a single paracentesis which is angled up into the anterior chamber so that I can try to create some room in the eye. This is a long cannula with lidocaine and I'm trying to inject a bit to provide some anesthesia and I'm bluntly dissecting insofar as I can just to try to create a little bit of space in between the back of the cornea and the front of the iris. I'm not overdoing it because I don't think that's really where I'm going to get the separation. This is how I'm going to create a deep chamber. You'll notice I'm making a small pyridomy inferotemporally. So I'm a left-handed surgeon. I'm using some cautery here just to create some hemostasis. And now with my dominant hand, my left hand, I'm making a triangular partial thickness scleral flap and I'm dissecting it up with a crescent knife. This is almost like I'm doing a trabeculectomy. I'm making a sclerostomy there with a 15 degree blade and then I'm doing a vitrectomy with no AC maintainer just to deepen the AC. So I'm doing a 
sort of blind vitrectomy. The vitrectomy probe is insinuated there behind the iris, and I keep it there in the pupillary aperture where I can watch the vitrectomy handpiece the mouth so I'm careful not to sort of incarcerate or incorporate any other surrounding tissue. But I'm vitrectomizing the eye with no fluid going into the eye because I want to soften the eye up and I want to remove content from behind the iris. So now that I've done this dry pars plane of vitrectomy, then I stick the AC maintainer into that single paracentesis that I've created and I turn it on air. So I have an assistant with a 60cc syringe that's fitted with air and he is pushing and you'll notice as he pushes the chamber deepens and that gives me room to make these accessory paracentesis in this main wound using a 2.4 millimeter keratome directly temporally. So that's how I deepen the anterior chamber to allow myself to make these additional incisions is first I remove volume from behind the iris with a dry vitrectomy and then I put air in the AC to blow everything back. Now I'm stripping under air using an inverted Sinsky hook. This is a light pipe. It's not a dedicated light pipe. This is an ECP probe. You know, BVI makes this ECP laser for um, a, a diode laser to treat glaucoma. It also has a light function, an LED light, and you can use that to give you enhanced contrast. And that is extremely useful here when you have a situation of poor corneal visibility. You can enhance your contrast by turning the microscope light off and using this uh, LED laser shown from the surface of the eye to cast shadows and to accentuate sort of the contrast that you get. Now I'm removing the air fill from the anterior chamber. I'm sort of verifying that we have a deep chamber all the way around. I'm reinstilling the AC maintainer, this time hooked up to balanced salt solution. And you'll notice I'm debriding the corneal epithelium. Why did I wait until then to take the epithelium off? Well, number one, I know my visibility is poor and I want great visibility when I'm doing the graft unfolding. That's the key thing. That's when you want to see the very best. And I wait to remove the epithelium because once you take the epithelium off, your visibility is transiently quite improved, but then it rapidly declines as the cornea swells. So you want to remove the epithelium not at the beginning of the case, but at the end of the case right before you need to see as good as you can for the next couple of minutes. So I've got the microscope light off and you'll notice I'm using this capsularexis handpiece that comes with our Ertley phaco emulsifying machine to make a far inferior iridotomy. And my visibility of that iridotomy is dramatically improved by that light source, that LED light probe. So here we go. I'm injecting the graft into the anterior chamber now. It's a large graft, like I always use for these bullous keratopathy eyes, but it's downgraded slightly by half a millimeter or 0.75 millimeters or so because I know I'm dealing here with a potentially shallow cramped anterior chamber. And we have a shallow anterior chamber. It's difficult to deepen. It's difficult to work with the graft. If you have some monster graft in the AC and you have to tumble it over or unfold it, it's harder with the extra compression of a shallow AC. So you want a slightly smaller graft than you would normally use. So I've just injected the graft into the anterior chamber. I've removed the air bubbles like I always do to clear the duct. And now I'm trying to figure out what's going on with this graft. Is it right side up? Is it upside down? I'm going to show you the full unedited series of maneuvers to unfold the graft. So here it is floating in the central anterior chamber and I'm jetting it with balanced salt solution trying to get the graft to declare itself, to try to open up, to see if it's right side up or upside down. In my mind as I look at this I think the graft is right side up and I'm using the long cannula to poke into the edges trying to check the Motsuro sign. I'm not really sure whether it was a positive sign or not, but the graft looks to be mostly unfolded at this point, so I'm trying to check it again. I'm trying to engage the edge of the graft with the cannula. I can't really tell, but 
I'm still proceeding with trying to unfold it. These are Dirazomer taps that I'm applying to the corneal surface, and I'm trying to get this graft unfolded. It looks like it's two-thirds of the way unfolded already. I'm deepening the chamber. I'm going to try to shuffle, bump it over to move it into the center of the AC. Here we go. The graft looks like it's at least 80% unfolded. I'm using the candle to sort of push it over to shove it into the nas nasal angle, and I still don't know whether this graft is right side up or upside down. Now, if you put the graft on upside down, of course, you get zero credit, you know? I mean, it, it doesn't work at all. So it doesn't, it doesn't count at all if the graft is not right side up. And here I am checking again the Mozero sign, and I still can't tell whether it's right side or up, upside down. So I have no choice but to deepen the chamber and shuffle the deck and try to figure out, is this graft right side up? But you just can't guess. You just can't take a chance. So here I am flipping and deepening uh, uh, the, the, the anterior chamber, and now the graft is curled. I've got good curled edges, and I'm going to try to check the Mosero sign again. Here I am. I'm pushing it into the edge of that curl, engaged. So I'm pushing it. The curl is right side up. It embraces the cannula, and now I know the graft is right side up. Now I'm positive I can finish unfolding. So the graft is 80% unfolded at this point. I'm using Dirazomer taps on the surface of the cornea. And now I feel like I have the graft mostly unfolded. I'm going to go ahead and lift it. Rather than lose this opportunity to lift the graft to the surface of the cornea, I put a small bubble underneath the graft. And I'm doing what are called, I think, Dirazomer taps on the surface of the eye. That's where you have a slightly shallow anterior chamber because you have the bubble lifting the graft up from behind, and you're doing Dirazomer taps on the surface of it. Now it looks like the graft is probably 90% unfolded, but over where the cannula is entering the eye, you'll notice as this bubble unfolds, you'll see this sort of cord, this sharp line. I've got an inward fold over there where I'm squirting now, okay? And the way you resolve an inward fold in the graft is always the same for every eye. And that is you shrink the bubble in the anterior chamber, you put more BSS into the eye, and you place taps outside of that folded edge, and that will bubble bump those inward folds out, okay? So the key to bubble bumping is you want a small bubble with a deep chamber. Now when you're shrinking the bubble, the trick when you're aspirating air is you always aspirate air from the eye using a cannula with BSS. You never aspirate air with an air cannula or an air syringe. The reason is, is if you try to aspirate air with a syringe or a cannula with air on it, then when you aspirate, you'll get a little bit of fluid wick up inside the cannula, and then the next time you go to inject air from that syringe, you'll inject foam. So if you ever have a situation where you're injecting thousands of little fish egg bubbles, that's probably why. It's because you've aspirated air with the air cannula, and you only want to aspirate air with the BSS cannula. Then when you go to inject air with the other syringe, you won't get foam. You'll get this nice, pure, unadulterated single bubble that expands. So here we go now. I've got the graft totally unfolded. It's up against the back surface of the cornea. I'm pressurizing the eye here. You'll notice we have basically a 100% air fill. The graft is entirely appositioned on the back surface of the cornea. And you'll further notice that at no point did I repair the scleral flap or the sclerostomy that I created to do the vitrectomy. So you might be saying, well, why did you even do that? Why not put a trocar in? And certainly I could have. I could have used a trocar. But a trocar is a disposable expense. You have to add on to the case. And it's not necessary. You'll notice that even though this is a flap that's made and just a stab incision into the pars plana with my 15 degree blade, the chamber was stable during the entire duration of the operation. At no point was the AC collapsing. I wasn't getting this massive egress of fluid from that sclerostomy. So you'll notice that was a surprisingly effective way to deepen the anterior chamber without needing a trocar or any sort of yeah, fancy system, just to make a single stab incision. Now, I'm not going to sew up the scleral flap. I'm just going to put a single stitch here in the conjunctiva just to close the conge over the top of that scleral flap, which I think is completely and totally um, uh, reasonable. 
And in fact, maybe this stitch wasn't necessary at all. Maybe I could have just concluded the operation here without needing to repair this pyridomy at, uh, at, at, at all. But the reason that I showed this video and the reason that I think that, th that this is such a good learning case, at least for me, is there are lots of very good DMEC surgeons out there that do DMEC for lots of normal cases, you know, normal cases of bullous keratopathy or Fuchs dystrophy, but they don't do DMEC in eyes that have been vitrectomized because you have to deal with a deep chamber. But a deep chamber is not a hindrance. A deep chamber is a gift from God. A deep chamber is something that you want to create in certain circumstances because you can work with a deep chamber. A deep chamber is a tool, and it's the only way to solve some of these eyes that have got a collapsed, compressed anterior chamber, is to deepen it first with something like a vitrectomy. So you have to be comfortable doing DMEC in eyes that have been vitrectomized so that you can do DMEC in eyes like this. And maybe you're watching this video and you're thinking, well, Jack, that eye shouldn't have had a DMEC anyway, okay? That eye was so sick, that cornea was so fibrotic, it was so opacified, you really should have done a PK on that eye. But you know, there's so many advantages to doing a DMEC in a situation like that as opposed to a PK. That eye's sick. That eye that we just watched, that eye's had multiple retinal detachments, it's had horrific glaucoma, it has a bleb. That eye, by the way, had an APD when we were operating on it. You would hate to operate on that eye with a PK and have a crystal clear cornea, for instance, and the patient's vision is still limited to hand motion or counting fingers or something like this, but now they have to spend a lifetime taking care of this organ that's sewn to the front of their face. You know, a, a, a DMEC, if you can achieve it, is a way to try to bring some corneal clarity back without subjecting the patient to a lifelong litany of extreme burdens and obligations that they have to take care of. A DMEC is a safe way to get what you can get without imposing a whole bunch of obligations on the patient forever. So I always try a DMEC first. You can later go back and do whatever you want. You can do a PK, you can do a K-Pro on this patient later, but this is the safest and best thing, in my opinion, to try first for these patients. And the trick was for this eye, for me, was to do this eye after doing the vitrectomy myself and by using a light pipe to enhance my own visualization. Other little tricks that we like to use is, you know, we give a small volume of Expirel, which is a long acting subconjunctival block. It keeps this eye numb for three days. That has made our patients way more comfortable. We have loved having a PA in our practice. It makes me much faster and more efficient. It helps us give better care to the patients because you're able to delegate different elements of the operation to people where that's their sole focus. So everybody's attention is devoted in entirely to the thing that they do best. You know, this operation, this complicated DMEC vitrectomy, uh, you know, this was a 25-minute surgery that we did in our office. So I think cases like this, these really complicated, demanding, challenging cases are manageable so long as you have the right strategy. And I hope this video helps you out there if you're thinking about undertaking DMEC in eyes with cramped, collapsed, or absent anterior chambers.